Hello and welcome to Nigger Report, your weekly roundup for all the latest Nigger news and all other photographic announcements that we found interesting. It's Constantine here. And this is Becky. All right, let's start with sales in UK and the EU. Apparently, Nikon just started 10% off Nikon lenses everywhere in the EU and UK. That's correct. So we have an instant discount. That means that you can just add things to your basket. They're already discounted. It runs until the 18th of September. So quite a short little window on this one. Just for clarification, we don't charge suggested retail price on a lot of items just because the internet is what it is and we have to stay competitive with other shops and dealers. So for that reason, if it doesn't quite add up to 10%, it's because it's 10% off the what should be the suggested retail price, not off the price that we've actually given. In some cases, that means that we're even cheaper than places like the Nikon store. So take advantage of that while you can. So it's still cheaper. Yeah but your mileage may vary. Exactly. Okay, now on to Z180-600. It's finally been shipping worldwide and people all over the place are getting their lenses. Small shipments everywhere, sold out everywhere. Some Japanese retailers now listing second shipment in the mid-January 2024. We think it's placeholders, so ignore all that. But tell us about UK shipment, Becky. How big was it? How many people got it? Give us all the stats. Our first shipment was very, very small, which means that only a handful of people, unfortunately, were able to get one from the first batch. However, we are hoping to see, even if it's a trickle, consistent deliveries over the next few weeks. So please be patient with us. We are doing everything we can and really just hounding Nikon to try and send us as many po as possible. But it looks like the, the UK in general did just get quite a small batch. I can't speak for lots of other dealers, but I do know some other dealers have spoken to them and people that have bought from them. And they've also said a similar thing. They got a small amount in the first batch, hoping for more in the next. All right. And while you're waiting for this lens to arrive, if you pre-ordered this, we have couple of hands-on reviews from the YouTube. So first one up is Richie, who published it about two months ago. But if you already watched it, here's a refresh for you anyway. Then we have Matt Granger. We also have Steve Perry and Dwight Payton, all looking as the use of this lens for wildlife photography. I guess if you can use it for wildlife, you can probably use it for sports as well. Now we've got a lens to try. So we're going to go this week I'm going to test it on all sorts of things, probably some action, hopefully. Hopefully. And uh, we will tell you at some point our findings. Exactly. And that's it on all the new news for this week. Thank you very much for joining us. We will see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> we have other information that we would like to impart. So basically, in the absence of the real Nikon news, and everyone apparently is waiting for this new camera to be released, which we talked about to death for the whole August, but apparently no news as of yet. When is going to come out? No one knows. Do you think it was a red herring? Well, I don't know. I mean, someone made the camera, right? And took pictures of it. And put them on Nikon rumors. Yeah. So I assume if the rumors are correct, if the dealers had this presentation in secret meetings, we don't know anything about it clearly, then obviously there was some camera production. But the question is why to do it so early yeah. and then not announce it? I mean, you know, it's supposed to be announced according to rumors on 2nd of August. Yeah, it didn't happen. Now, literally, the, all the rumors completely die down, but we pretty much know all the specs at this point, all the looks, everything that needs to be known. Well, according to rumors, obviously, you know, not real, but apparently we know what the camera is, but there is no news when it's going to be announced. So what happened, Becky? What do you think? I truly don't know. I'm I'm a mystery about this. I find it a very strange, in fact, unprecedented series of events. Yeah. Because I don't think we've ever had it before where we've had this much information released, or even, albeit on Nikon Rumors, but still lots of information, pictures of the camera, etc., which hasn't then immediately been followed by a camera release. I mean, with the Z8 even, they were only sort of releasing the specs once the first teaser had appeared. Mm -hmm. And then we knew that there were going to be four teasers or three teasers mm. and then the announcement. So this is really, this is uncharted territory for us. And I'm, I, for one, am very confused. All right. So tell us the internet. What do you think have happened? If we sign up to the theory that the camera is supposed to be announced on 2nd of August, we know all the specs, what do you think? What is your conspiracy theory? What happened with that announcement? Do you think this camera is hoax or it actually exists and you can just waiting for the right time? We want to hear you in the comments below. Have your say. Now on to some other 
non Nikon rumor related. But news. the global news, <laughs> okay. apparently, Nikon, as well as little company called Sony, uh -huh. is saying that the market, the camera market specifically, is booming thanks to China. Excellent. So apparently shipments for digital cameras are at their highest point since the onset of COVID-19. And the boom is largely driven by China, both Nikon and Sony say. So in early August shipment reports from the Camera and Imaging Products Association, as we know as CEPA, mm -hmm. showed an upswing in sales that was being tied directly to an increase in global tourism. However, of all countries, China was the leading driver of that demand with a massive 44% increase in sales, easily the largest sales increase of any region in the world. Yeah, and the shipment value to China increased by almost 34% year to year, so to 83.9 billion yen. So the volume increased 26.7% as well, which is total to about 710,000 units. Amazing increase. Obviously, China's been developing for a long time. It seems like it's starting to stagnate, but I assume that now we're starting to see a new money in China, or middle class people who can afford this equipment. And we can see that Nikon invest in the retail stores while the general mall is dying all over the world. Apparently in China, the malls are booming. You know, so here you have it. It's it's very interesting development. Obviously, they've been a bit late to the party, but apparently that's where the magic happens right now. Yes. Nikon's director and senior managing executive officer, Yoshiaki Tokunari, actually said that the rebounding camera market is thanks to China now leading the industry's recovery. And he said the Chinese market is a driving force. The overall market for cameras, which are luxury items, is growing. And I think we probably also observe that just from this viewpoint, that the luxury brand market is very, very big in China, mm -hmm. more so than ever before. You're absolutely right. If you actually see the sales in the UK and let's say sales around the Oxford Street and Regent Street, mm. you see that a lot of tourists from Asia buy a lot of luxury goods. We're not talking just camera equipment, but luxury bags, etc. Speaking of luxury bags, company like Billingham said that they've increased their export to China by a lot. <laughs> and that's all you need to know about this. So it seems like there's new money in there. So people are willing to buy and spend. And in terms of this, it's good that Nikon is investing because they want to sell more units. Now, what we need to think about from here, mm. yeah, the good old Europe, we need to think of, well, if Nikon can make the equipment and sell the equipment and make more equipment and invest in developing the new camera models and lenses, it's always good to have markets to sell those goods if they're not selling as well in other regions. Yes. So in my opinion, it's the more the merrier. It's always good to see that before we had kind of the whole photographic market, especially like leading to COVID, it was kind of all dying. And then we had not just COVID, but also we had a lot of logistical issues, semiconductor shortages, mm -hmm. where they couldn't really make enough equipment to sell as well. So it seems like now we don't have those issues and we also have markets that are willing to buy the equipment. So it's a win-win in my books. Tell us what you think. Make your voice be heard in the comments below. Interesting emphasis on that. Okay, now on to more industry news. According to the Nikkei Industry Map 2024 edition that was released in August of this year, just a couple of weeks ago, Nikon is actually at third place in the camera market share worldwide. I assume that's uh, according to units either shipped or sold, and Nikon on third place at, uh, with 840,000 cameras, while Sony is on second place by 1 million more at 1.88 million, and then Canon at 3.3 million units, which is incredible, 46.5% share. So what I want to do, Peggy, is I want to ask our viewers, What's so special about Canon? Because from personal view, from my photographic journey, mm. I have no interest in Canon brand at all. They make lovely prints as I have one. I tried 5D Mark II back in the day. Yes, that's It was right. a good camera. You had it, one. Yeah, uh, 24 uh, to 105 or 4. It was, it was a good lens, but there was no magic about it. And I guess it's to do with that I was using Nikon for so long that I just like the build quality and maybe the buttons and the menu system of Nikon's that I never looked into Canon's. Now, because of the YouTube and the internet, 
it made me think that Sony is really good. So I always look into Sony because they were innovating, you know, mm -hmm. new sensors, new, you know, water focus systems, yada, yada, yada. So I was always looking to them and actually looking to like Sony A1, what does it do compared to, let's say, Nikon Z9, you know? Mm -hmm. I would do my research. But something like R3 or R5, I was never interested. No. So it's obviously a personal thing. I, I'm sure Canon does good cameras. But I want to know what you think. Obviously, on Nikon channel, it's going to be hard to gather those opinions. But if you are a Canon user or if you use Canon in the past, tell us what's good about them because they obviously have 46.5% share worldwide of all photograph ma market. That's basically almost 50%. So there should be something special about it. One thing that I wonder if Canon do differently, and I, I don't know if this is still the case, but at one point Canon were kind of the brand you would look at if you did want to do video. And Nikon sort of lagged behind a little bit there. So I wonder if it, at that point when people were entering into the DSLR slash video space, yeah. they were going for Canon and now they've, they've just continued the trend of buying Canon cameras and lenses. But I can't think, you know, off the top of my head, I don't immediately go, oh, well, Canon are superior in blah, so therefore that's why they sell more units. Mm. Whereas with Sony, we know that they've really doubled down on the video space massively, but also they've they've kind of done something where they appeal to a sort of younger market that mm. I don't necessarily immediately associate with Canon or even Nikon. That's so true. it's tricky. One thing that does interest me though is Fuji are exactly half the market share of Nikon yeah. at 420,000 units. And it's also interesting because a lot of people were saying that in some cases, Fuji was actually going ahead of Nikon. Mm. And according to Nikkei Industry Map 2024, that's not there's the quite a gap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the video, and that's the reason why I tried Canon 5D Mark II. Because yeah. we had the D90. That's right. And we had D700. Mm. And D700 with its 12 megapixels was competing with 5D Mark II with, a, I think, 21 megapixels. I could be wrong on this one. But 5D Mark II had the video. And 5D Mark II, while coming out after D90, D90 second was the first DSLR with video functionality. Mm -hmm. But 5D Mark II came out later and actually monopolized pretty much this video side of things on DSLRs. Yeah. And a lot of videographers started with those cameras because it was one of the first affordable camera for videographers. Now, let me rephrase why I'm not interested in Canon. Because Canon, Sony, and Nikon compete literally in the same space. Mm -hmm. The reason why I'm always interested in Fuji or Leica spray because they do things differently mm -hmm. from Nikon. And in terms of this, yes, I tried X-Pro series, I tried GFX, uh, we tried Leicas, and they're interesting cameras because they do things differently. Now, Sony obviously is leader of the pack in terms of technology. And I guess that's the reason why we're looking towards Sony and see how Nikon compares to them. Mm. But because Canon does basically the same thing as Nikon, it was never interesting to me. Why would I substitute one thing basically for the same thing of different brand. Sure. Back in the day, I remember when people said Canon had warmer colors. I remember that was, you know, the early digital times, you know. Yeah. And sometimes even now we get people say, oh, Canon's blah lens, whatever it is, is better than Nikon's equivalent lens and vice versa. Honestly, I think a lot of it is personal preference more than anything else. That's On true. paper, I don't know if there genuinely is a, a colossal difference. That's true. A lot of people actually said that the Canon, because of the one cows, was more consumer rendering, while Nikon was more neutral. Mm. And to all those people, I say, well, change your white balance, you know. But tell us what you think. It's a really interesting conversation. And I definitely want to know your opinion because I've never been interested in Canon. And maybe after your comments, you suddenly will be. <laughs> I'll suddenly switch and I'll release a video why I sold all my Nikon and switched to Canon. More on that later. <laughs> now for some third-party news for you. Leo Photo have released an NF06, which is a replacement foot for the Nikon Z 800mm 6.3 400 2.8 and 600 f4 mirrorless lenses. So one foot to rule them all in this case. Well, apparently that's your Arc Swiss fix. But if you don't like Leo Photo, there's a really right stuff LCF 22, which is a little bit more expensive. And also there's Kirk LP72 and LP72 SG plates that will give you that Arc Swiss fix on those long lenses. Now, one of the complaints about all Nikon lenses with tripod foods is lack of arc space. Mm -hmm. So I assume this is a good solution for not a lot of money. So yeah, if you need one of those, then you have definitely plenty of choices to put on your long lenses. Now to some interesting lenses with tons of character, Maya Optic Girl is Biota 75 f1.5 Mark II. It's a newly and updated lens of the 
all design. It's finally available for order for Nikon Z and F mounts. And the beauty of this particular lens is those swirly character bokeh. Yes, very, very interesting lens. Now, just to give you a little bit of history of this lens, in the 1930s, the designer Willy Melter developed the original Bayata 75mm 1.5, and the lens gained huge popularity, a legendary reputation, a great success. But due to World War II, the high production costs, etc., meant that it was discontinued. Now, thanks to Maya Optic, we have a new improved version for F mount and Z mount. And if you have a little look at the sample images, it does look like a truly unique lens. I'm really, really excited to see this one in the flesh. Now remember that Meyer Optics also has this Triaplan 100 f 2.8 lens. Also want to try that which one. Which costs 1,000 euros, mm -hmm. right? And recently, TT Artson released a replica, so three element lens 100 f 2.8 as well, which gives you literally the same effect, mm -hmm. but for about $150. Yes. So in a way, in a way, I like those lenses because they have tons of characters, mm -hmm. but because Meyer Optic lenses, obviously it's a company with a, huge history, the lenses are made in Germany, you know, mm -hmm. but they're very expensive. And for the effect they give, which I would call special effect, it wouldn't be probably my only lens that I would use. No. I personally think that the prices are quite high for a lot of people. Sure. And it's good that the companies like T.T. Arson releasing those lenses that create very similar effect to this. As I say, it's not one-to-one -one reproduction, but if I can try a lens for $150 or I have to pay 1,000 euros, to try a lens with similar effect, I would choose a cheaper lens, just for fun, because if I don't like it, I can always sell it. Now, if you don't want to spend 1,399 euros for 75 1.5 lens, have a look at Helios lenses. Good old Soviet lenses, you know, 50, 60 quid on eBay. They obviously give slightly different, but similar effect of all those really bulky and everything, and they don't cost an arm and a leg. But it's good that Mayo Optic updates those lenses. Obviously, people who will buy, they'll enjoy them. Excellent. So, now, for you, memory card lovers, if you like CF Express cards, apparently there's a new update in specifications to CF Express card format. It's update version 4.0, which should increase the speed of reading and writing up to four gigabytes from current two gigabytes. And it is retrospectively compatible with all the CF Express card slots. So if you are Z9 and Z8 user, you know, all those future cards will have faster read and writing speeds, which means, which means that first of all, progress is good. Second of all, the price is gonna be higher on that, but it will push the prices of the current memory cards, hopefully, a little bit low. Because CF Express cards, while they're nice, they're not exactly cheap, they're not exactly SD card prices. No. So fingers crossed, hopefully that will bring the speed to the masses at affordable prices. The future is now thanks to science. Exactly. One thing that I find interesting is that Delkin actually quite frequently update their cards so that they can make them faster, yeah. but at usually lower price points than the previous generation. So we've just had an update to 325 and 650 gig cards mm -hmm. and actually going up to, they have a two terabyte card. So they've... They couldn't do it with the 150 gigs because unfortunately, price-wise, it just didn't make any economic sense to make that card faster. They couldn't bring the price down, essentially. So they've left the 150 gig card as is, but with the 325 and the 650, you'll see some subtle updates. And to be honest, you won't even notice them on our website necessarily if you're going to buy cards. But in the fine, fine, point, fine print there you'll see, oh, the write speeds are actually a bit faster than mm. previous generations, but the card has just come down by 30 pounds or whatever it is. So progress is good. Exactly. And I'm really glad that people have time to read all those small prints. But uh, one thing I like about CF Express format compared to XQDs, mm. remember different iterations of XQDs where they didn't work with some card readers, they didn't work on some cameras, et cetera, et cetera. Painful. So CF Express is definitely much better, mm -hmm. you know, and from what we've seen, even like, let's say, Nikon has a recommended list of cards, and it's a small list, yeah. but actually, in our experience, basically, it's not CF Express cards, it will work in a Nikon camera. Yeah. Some of them obviously get a little bit hotter, some of them are cooler, so that's where you probably would want to definitely read some reviews, especially if you're a power user, and by power user, I mean... 8K, 60 frames per second, but it's good to have it. How do you normally buy your memory cards? Do you buy memory cards where you need them or you wait for this specific release and then you pre-order them? 
I normally buy a memory card when I need them. Yeah. You know? So I don't really care. So if I need the latest, I'll get the latest. But yeah. I don't really wait for the news and say, oh, I'm going to now wait for those Tier Express 4.0 cards. No, exactly. Because it's an absolute necessity for taking photographs in this day and age. You can't take pictures in a film camera without buying film. Yeah, it's so. very expensive, a roll of film. <laughs> you know, my roll of film cost £12. Your roll of film cost £500. I, I have to point out that the amount of rolls of films worth of photos you can take on a memory card and keep reusing it. <laughs> Plus, you yeah, you can't reuse the film, yeah. But, you know, if you buy a roll of film, like 400 feet roll of film, 250 degree, that's a lot of pictures. Yeah. That's 72 rolls, bulk rolled. Wow. Yeah. And then you've got to pay to develop them, unless you do it yourself. But people have time to read small print, so why not? <laughs> people have time for some weird things, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's whatever you prioritize, whatever you give your energy to. I prioritize happiness. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Can we move on from this section? Now to some software. NewsDX so updated their optic modules with added support of the latest Atmount lenses. Now we have support for Nikon Z400 lenses, including standard converters, as well as DX2417, which we're still waiting our review sample for. New release Sigma lenses for Z-Mount, three of those, and a bunch of white lens lenses. So if you're a Nikon user and you use DXO software, definitely update your modules. Now for your reviews, Tom Hogan, finally has published a d6 camera review and also the complete guide to the d6 is now available to purchase and for one clear reason because he thinks that the d6 is the best dslr ever made shots fired yeah he says okay so maybe it doesn't have the d850's 45 megapixel image sensor but in virtually every other respect the d6 is nikon's statement of this is what a DSLR should be. It deserves a review and book of its own for sure. And I have to say, we're really happy to see that Tom is giving some love to the DSLRs. It's, uh, there are still many, many people out there using DSLRs and also very recently have, you know, bought or added D6s to their collection. So if you're a professional photographer, there isn't a better DSLR out there except the D850 and the D6. I would say those two side by side. If you need 45 megapixels, it's the D850. Well, first of all, better late than never, that's for sure. Second of all, D850 is a clearly the best DSLR I've ever made, in my humble opinion. Now, maybe, maybe, maybe in terms of technology, if you, if you look at, let's say, in terms of specs, maybe D6 is that it's, you know, the best camera ever made, but we're not looking at the specs over. We're looking at the kind of all round aspects of the camera. And why can't D6 be the best DSLR ever made? Well, very simple answer is the size of the camera. It's, it's the same thing as the Z8 and Z9. Now, Z9 is a better camera. Now, which camera is gonna sell more units? Z8 or Z9? Probably Z8. Which camera will people think is the best mirrorless camera ever made? Probably Z8 over Z9. And the reason for that is the size, because there are a lot more people will have it. For me personally, D850 mm. was the camera that stayed with me for quite some time, that could do anything you could throw at it. Mm -hmm. But for small portion of people who shoot in low light, shoot sports and wildlife, D6 is a great camera. The problem was with D6, and remember the overall kind of reception that it got. It came out around COVID time. It did. Right at the beginning, right when we were supposed to have our Olympics. And I think if, if it had been an Olympic year and that had never happened, the D6 honestly would have taken its place in the Nikon Hall of Fame as, you know, the ultimate flagship body. And it is a, it is a shame for that camera to not have gotten the recognition it deserved. But it's the same thing with the D780, I will say. Yeah. Obviously, we're talking about different consumers yep. for the D780, but the D780 was revolutionary in terms of DSLR users being able to dip their toe into the Z autofocus technology in a hybrid camera, essentially. So yeah. I think that Nikon in recent times from the D850, D780 and D6 brought out fantastic DSLRs and it's a real shame that we're not going to see any more. Yeah, I, you literally uh, stole my thoughts. I mean, D eight, seven, eight, and D six are the most underappreciated cameras. Yeah, you know, but D eight fifty is the best one though. What do you think? <laughs> it's not going to let that go. Well, right. Let us know in the comments below.
Moving on, now we have a little bit of a clickbaity title for you, but this is fun. It is, How the Nikon Z8 Led Me Back to Nikon with the Z9. Goodbye, Leica and Sony. My review by Steve Huff, Photo and Hi-Fi. Now, this one came via recommendation of one of our viewers, and we do encourage you to send us your video recommendations Always. on anything Nikon related. Now, personally, I hate videos that say why I sold this and switched to this brand, first of all. The good news about this video, and the reason why I include it, is it's actually got a good context, you know. But overall, definitely, if you're a YouTuber, stop using these clickbaity titles, even if the algorithm is encouraging you to do that. Yeah, it's only going to make it worse otherwise. Exactly. Because... Because, because we, Con doesn't like them. I hate clickbait with a passion. So do you, I hope. And on that note, moving on to your weekend read and watch segment, we have Nikon Sessions episode two of season two. This is photography as self-expression. And this week, Rishi is joined by Carolyn Mendelssohn, Kino, and Heather Agepong. Now, they discuss how photography and filmmaking can be an outlet for self-expression. Listen to their insights on how powerful an image becomes when printed and what effect it can have on oneself emotionally and mentally. So you watched the first season of this show with Richie in there as a main character. Was there a Red Wedding equivalent episode in there? <laughs> there was no Red Wedding. Just uh, Richie takes out a machete and... No, no, there, there, was, there were no groundbreaking sort of Game of Thrones scenes in there. But they, these photographers have a lot of really good things to yeah, say. Yeah, was there like a top 10 anime betrayals kind of moment in there? No, but what they did have was people who are professionals in their field talking about photography rather than the equipment talking about photography which is is really what we wanted to get down I know to. in this day and age people are talking about photography doesn't sound that sexy is it it's not 45 megapixel sensor with 250 frames per second isn't it and Nigel Danson is back his video is literally I'm back where I love. He's in Scotland's best kept secret with the Nikon Z8. So have a look at his joyful video. Watch some landscape photography. And maybe one day we'll make it to Scotland. I want to go to Scotland. There's loads of places I want to go. It's just like trying to be able to figure out how to do that. Yeah, maybe next year to the Fringe. That would be cool. Yeah, with our stand-up show. Conan Becky on photography. Maybe. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us this week. Thank you very much for watching and or listening. Please give us a like and a subscribe if you're on YouTube, if you're listening on a podcast platform, a follow, a rating, a review, any of those things would be hugely appreciated. Let me name a few. Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, even YouTube. Apparently in the United States have some podcasts and we are there. So do leave us a review. Do listen to us in your cars, on the tube. We want to live in your ears forever. But in the meantime, do find us in this social space. Yes, we're on Instagram. I'm at Rebecca underscore Danese. The shop is at Nick on at Grays. And I'm at Constantine Kochkin. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.